Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tammy Wilson, and I am from the Sacramento County Office of Education and the project lead for the California Dyslexia Initiative. We are really excited to have so many friends and colleagues from across our state and other states join us for this learning opportunity. This is the final webinar for this year in our Understanding Dyslexia webinar series. And we are really excited to have Marlou Gorno Tempini here. I know that you are going to learn a lot from her. We have had the privilege uh, at SCOE to partner with the UCSF Dyslexia Center in this initiative. And we have learned quite a bit and know that today will be a great opportunity for you to explore this content and learn from Marlou. We've created a Padlet that will host the slides as well as a webinar companion document that includes some discussion prompts and additional resources to uh, further explore content. And our recordings will be posted on the website about a week after the session. So our uh, goals for the California Dyslexia Initiative are to really focus on building knowledge, skills, and capacity across the state through our system of support for other COEs and LEAs, really to really deepen our understanding around early intervention and supports for students with dyslexia and early intervention models. And we are definitely working on professional learning opportunities. And this webinar series is one of those opportunities. I'm really excited to hand the mic over to my colleague, Jessica Hammond, who is the founder and CEO of Glean Education. And she is helping us with the coordination of our webinar series. So I'm gonna hand off to Jessica to get this webinar started. Marlou, if you can switch to the next slide. Thank you, Tammy. We are thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who may not know us, Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. Next slide, please. This is the seventh in a final and final in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of our nation's top experts in the field. If you missed the previous webinars, you can find the recordings, companion documents, and additional resources at the SCOE website through the link in the chat. Next slide, please. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Maria Luisa Gorno Tempini, known by her colleagues and mentees as Mary Lou. Dr. Gorno Tempini is the Charles Schwab Distinguished Professor in Dyslexia and in Dyslexia at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a behavioral neurologist and neuroscientist who began her career at UCSF researching primary progressive aphasia, or PPA a neurodegenerative disease that begins in the language networks of the brain. Her groundbreaking work at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center led to the current diagnostic criteria and conception of PPA as three, different con as three distinct conditions, not one. Her own journey as the parent of a dyslexic child brought her to work with colleagues in both neurology and psychiatry to shed similar light on developmental dyslexia. Dr. Gorno Tempini is now the director of the ALBA Language Neurobiology Lab and co-director of the UCSF Dyslexia Center, as well as the UCSF UC Berkeley Schwab Center for Dyslexia and Cognitive Diversity. Dr. Jo Gorno Tempini leads a multidisciplinary team of scientists, physicians, speech language pathologists, engineers, and legal scholars to investigate and translate the latest discoveries into real solutions for people living with dyslexia. Dr. Gorno Tempini and the UCSF Dyslexia Center are partnered with the Sacramento County Office of Education in the California Dyslexia Initiative. The UCSF Dyslexia Center also is leading the development of Multitudes, a free culturally affirming early screening and intervention program for California schools. Please help me extend a warm welcome to Dr. Gorno Tempini.
Thank you very much, um, Tammy and Jessica. Thank you for the invitation. It is uh, an honor to be here, and it has indeed been a privilege to work with the Sacramento County Office of Education uh, on our common um, goals in the past uh, couple of years. So I've been given a hard task in 45 minutes to talk both about dyslexia and the learning brain. So I'm gonna do my best to try to keep our time together as relevant as possible. As a first point, I wanted to um, just reiterate what a little bit what Jessica said is what we are um, about at UCSF Dyslexia um, Center. Um, we really trying to apply the translational approach that UCSF is world renowned for to go all the way from basic science, bench science, all the way to influencing people's lives and um, policy and advocacy. So we believe that for learning differences and dyslexia in particular, this approach has lacked in the uh, past decades. And um, we are hoping that altogether we can change um, this and create a multidisciplinary approach in which basic science, clinical care, education, technology, and policy um, can all come together for uh, the good of our uh, children. So um, I'm a behavioral neurologist, um, which is a little bit of a half away between a psychiatrist and a neurologist. So we focus on um, study and caring for individuals who have uh, difficulty in uh, cognitive and behavioral um, uh, brain health. Um, we really uh, focus on trying to match what the um, individuals um, complain of, suffer of, their strengths and weaknesses with brain biology and brain networks uh, in the brain. And um, one um, concept that is perhaps trivial, but I always like to stress, is that we need to think of really as human behavior, all aspects of human behavior, as emerging from the functions of different neural networks in the brain. And because we have different neural networks, and we'll go through some of them and how they develop, um, we really should move away from thinking of intelligence as a unitary concept and think that these aspects of human behavior are not just relevant for cognition, so we're not just talking about language, and including reading for our particular interests, but also emotions, motivations, attention, musical talent, all different aspects of the human experience really emerge from the functioning of these different uh, neural networks and the interactions between them. So it is really the, the let's say, norm that we would have asymmetric intelligences, just as we have different skills in our um, other parts of our bodies, so someone can run faster or someone can be uh, uh, better at lifting weights, and we'll have intelli different intelligences. And the combinations of the strengths and weaknesses in all of these domains is what makes every individual uh, unique. Um, that says the, these neural uh, networks have developed and evolved at different um, uh, stages of um, evolutions and they uh, evolve and start working in different ways depending on a person's age. And so we can identify patterns uh, if we really keep uh, uh, close and attentive to the uh, um, developing, uh, fast developing neuroscience that I think can help not only clinical care, but also um, education. So some really basic um, concepts that I wanted to um, uh, just put out there for our conversation. Uh, as I've probably used these terms here and there. So what, what is a network? A network, we used to think of, of brain regions and brain areas, and that each brain area does something specific in the brain. And in the past 20 years of neuroscience research, we really realized that there is no single area that works on their own, and there is really different networks connected. And uh, we talk about structural network, functional network, and we often probably heard the terms gray matter and white matter, and they seem big, complicated terms, but in reality, what it means is that in, in the gray matter of the brain, this um, uh, uh, area in the surface of the brain is where the 
the, the cells, the neural cells, the body of the neuron is. And the white matter, which you see is much, uh, it's, it's lighter, is where the axons of the neurons are. So the connections are in the white matter. The neurons, the cell bodies, and the synapses, so where one neuron connects to the next, are in the gray matter. And how do we study these, the structure and function of these uh, networks in, uh, in, the, in the laboratory is mainly with, um, at, at least at UCSF, with the MRI. And we can look at the structure of the brain, and we can look at the structure of the, of the gray matter, so we can see the patterns of these foldings, or we can look at the uh, structure of the connections with specific techniques. So you can see here that with this technique, all the connections look the same. It all looks like a light gray, white area, but actually using specific techniques, we can isolate uh, down the different fibers. The same way, the functioning of the gray matter, we can look at the anatomy of it, so how it folds and how thick it is, how much volume there is in different regions, or you, we can also look at its function, and we look at its function by um, analyzing how much oxygen it uses and how much oxygen's areas use at the same time. So if you look at this curve, you can imagine these uh, uh, the dots and the continuous line as two different areas that are going up and down together. So if they're using the same amount of oxygen, that means they're working together. And these are what we call functional networks. So different functional networks that we were saying, we're not gonna go through them all, but this is just to give you an example of, of how many there are. And, and these are really the networks that we were talking about at the beginning that are associated with different processes. So for instance, we can think of, we can look at this somatomotor network. So that means that those are the areas of the brain that, uh, that are activated when someone touches your hand or when you move the hand. So the sensation and the motor output are in those regions. And similarly, we can have networks that are involved in attention, in visual processing, very important for reading, and of course in language. And this is something that we really uh, work on deeply in our laboratory. So these on the right, you'll see a lot of different colors, networks that are involved in different aspects of language that are all very important to uh, reading and, and writing. And we'll go through how these networks develop to really want to stress how fundamental the interaction between the genetics, but also the environment in the development of these networks. So what, um, what you do in the, in the classroom and what we do as parents at home and in all our interaction with children really shapes their brain. So this is of course a simplified view, but you can see that there are specific networks for speech and grammar, uh, for phonology and auditory processing, for semantics and vocabulary, and for what I call orthography, which is really for decoding um, visual symbols and attaching them uh, to sounds. So very different, let's say, muscles in the brain that uh, uh, um, sustain different processes that are fundamental for reading and literacy. So how do these networks develop? Of course, they develop uh, in utero, but the development continues all the way up to 25 years of age. Uh, the parents of teenagers and young adults in the, <laughs> in the audience will relate to that. There is a lot still going on of that age. We really need to think about the adolescent and, and um, young adult brain as uh, developing, still developing. And what are the processes of development? So one important process is neuronal migration. So what does it mean? In, in development, in very early stages, all the neurons, all those cells that will uh, form the gray matter are actually stored here in the deep part of the brain. And then they literally have to migrate out to populate the gray matter. It's a hugely biologically complicated process regulated by hundreds of genes. And it's really astonishing to think how well it goes most of the time. And we thought that this happened only in utero but actually uh, an amazing researcher at UCSF, Mercedes Paredes, discovered that this process continues um, after birth. So from the, from the inside you see is that 
is those uh, pink uh, neurons need to migrate all the way out. Another process that is important for development is myelination. You might have heard this term. So the myelin is, a sh is um, let's say, an insulation that we put, uh, that, are, um, that is around the axons of the neurons to, that makes the uh, neural signal uh, propagate faster. So it can jump from one node to the next. The newborn brain basically is not myelinated and it keeps myelinating again all the way to 25 years of age. It's interesting to think that it myelinates starting from the back to the, to the front and from, uh, so from the back to the front and from the ventral, so ventral means the lower part of the brain to the dorsal part of the brain. And this is the, the reason why children, for instance, learn, uh, understand language before they, um, they can speak because the ventral part of the brain is involved in understanding language while the dorsal, more dorsal network are more involved, are involved in, speak, in speech. So part of the issues of our terrible twos is that kids can understand but they cannot express themselves yet. And even that is very clearly, um, of course, you know, if you think about it, of course it's coming from the brain, but um, thinking about it as a specific neuro neurodevelopmental, neurobiological phases um, might be even more useful. Um, from the back to the front, so visual areas uh, develop earlier than areas in, than the frontal lobes, areas involved in planning, executive functioning, motivation. Going back to our adolescents and young adults, those are the areas that develop in, um, uh, during adolescence. Another process very important for, uh, for development and plasticity in the brain is synaptic remodeling. So these synapses are where two neurons meet each other. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive to think that the brain in early childhood, we can see here at around two years, has a lot of synapses. And then this process called pruning happens, meaning that we will, some of the synapses uh, uh, are lost and we strengthen only the synapses of the, the uh, networks that we actually use. So this is a little bit where the use it or lose it comes from. And look at the age in which is more important from you know, three, four to 16. So that reminds us of a pre-K to 12 and how important how we teach it and interact with our children is in that specific moment. And even early, early on, four or five year olds are very, um, it's a very good delicate time in neurodevelopment in which what we do would influence their brain anatomy and function for their whole life. Not that things cannot be changed later, but this is a really fundamental uh, time. So an, an interesting uh, way in which the brain develops specialization for different functions, and, it's, and we will go through specifically um, language and math, is that it becomes, through the pruning and myelination, and uh, processes, it becomes more f focal in the sense that, let's say if, uh, if a young child would look at, and actually I have the, the video of, of that later, but it, it tends to activate more and in a, a specific way at a younger age. And then as it, the brain gets exposed through environment to specific tasks and there is repetition and uh, of certain patterns, the activation becomes more focal. So in this, in this visual um, depiction, I'll show you kind of here a lot of different connections, they all look the same, and then they become more specialized for specific functions. So the activation is not more, it actually becomes less and more specific in response to sp specific environmental views. And the same for the, um, uh, the white matter. So how do we put reading into this? Reading is super interesting uh, because it's an acquired skill, right? It's this unique human skills, is new, uh, and I know you've heard this probably from um, many of my colleagues uh, uh, before. It's new, we don't have, 6,000 years is not enough time for the brain to develop a reading brain, really, or a reading network. It needs to fit reading within the, uh, 
different networks that you saw in the first slides. We need to kind of readapt them. Plast used our plasticity, pruning, myelination to create a system that is not just language, but is specialized for reading. It needs to be taught. For most people, it needs to be taught. There are very few um, individuals that would learn to read even if they're not explicitly taught. It's very heritable, 60%, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And is uh, ubiquitous in the sense that difficulties and different skills in, in reading um, happen in every language, um, but the symptoms, the way they manifest, might be different depending on the typology, the type of language that a child or an adult speaks. But the neural mechanism and the existence of variability in ability to read um, happen in every culture and every um, country. So this is the, the example that I wanted to show. Um, there is a specific region in the brain that, for instance, as an example, that is specialized to um, analyze the visual aspects of words. You might have heard the term. It's called the visual word form area. It's in this lower part of the brain. This is a cut of the brain through this line here. So, so this is you looking at the brain from the side. This is you looking at the brain from the top. So this is what we call visual cortex. So the part of the brain, one of those networks in the back of the brain that responds only to visual stimuli. And by exposure to different um, items, so houses, stools, faces, words, numbers, some parts of this circuit become more specialized for, for words. And also we see in the human brain compared to non-human primate brain that the connectivity of this particular area of the brain becomes more um, uh, uh, structured. So if you see in the, for instance, in the macaque brain, there is no link between this lower part of the visual uh, brain that is important for reading words and this more dorsal part up here that is involved in language. And as uh, humans, um, humans evolved, there is greater connectivity. And that might be a way that reading emerged from, from language. As I was saying before, the activations, the response to, of the brain to reading becomes more and more focal, more and more specialized, more organized as we teach um, reading. So by the time uh, children, um, these are some of the studies showing this, in uh, a young age, this whole different part of the brain activates when we show children words. And um, the red parts are the ones that become more focalized and more specialized for words compared to faces or chairs or buildings as we start to teach um, uh, children how to read and how they get ex uh, exposed to print. So this is to really f uh, stress again how important uh, the, uh, your work as teachers is really uh, changing the anatomy and the physiology of children's um, brain and, um, and um, the importance of, uh, uh, of, of, of your work in shaping really their brain. So as we said, there's different ages in development of the lower part of the brain that we call ventral, kind of like the stomach of the brain <laughs> develops earlier. And, in, and the dorsal part uh, develops later from the back to the front. So word meaning, visual property of words are acquired first, phonology, fluency, articulation later, and attention and um, comprehension of, and abstraction of a complex text even later. So what are the factors that influence reading? And this is, is really important, and I'm sure you've heard uh, about this as well, is not as a multifactorial process. And we'll talk about it in the same way for emotion processing and maybe mathematical processing if we have time. There is an interaction between brain organization and brain biology and time of development and environment and culture and teaching. And all of these different aspects will result in different uh, abilities to read. Distributed normally as we all biological um, uh, um, uh, variables are distributed. So there might be ch uh, children and individuals who are super readers, the ones in, that will learn how to read and decode even if no one teaches them. 
And then the majority that will need to be taught maybe differently uh, depending on their strengths and weaknesses. And then there'll be a percentage that will be uh, struggling. And, and that takes us to uh, talking about developmental dyslexia. I know you've heard a lot about this, so I don't wanna um, spend too much time. It's specific learning disability of neurobiological origin. And that's why we did this whole introduction about what is the neurobiology and the development of the different language systems, difficulties with accurate fluent word recognition and spelling, uh, preserved co general cognitive abilities and adequate instruction. This is where this multifactorial um, uh, model comes in. And most often uh, caused by, or we'll talk about that, but accompanied by phonological difficulties and slow word retrieval, so rapid naming. Um, I'm sure you heard about this from Marianne Wolf. And also difficulty with auditory short-term memory, which is a very complicated long words to say, difficulty holding sounds and words into one, in, in, uh, in uh, one's mind for a few seconds. Um, again, it's a multifactorial probabilistic uh, definition, and it has different names, and this has always been confusing. Um, different field of study, neuroscience, medicine, education use different name for this um, uh, specific difficulty with acquiring and, and fluent reading. In the more medical psychiatric DSM term, it's called specific learning disorder, reading disorder. The IDA calls it specific learning disability and dyslexia. Um, in all of um, medicine and um, maybe also in your field of education, terminology and nosology is always an issue. And I think having a definition is more important than having a name. Um, so debates regarding both the cognitive, so the mechanisms, which networks, which mechanisms are important in dyslexia, and also what is the neurobiological origin. Um, this is the, a lot of the research that we uh, concentrate on at, at UCSF, trying to really understand the neuroanatomical, biological uh, correspondence between symptoms and biology to then better understand um, uh, intervention uh, approaches. Um, multifactorial, the risk factors and resilient factors. I'm sure you heard this uh, from Dr. Katz in his previous um, talk. Um, we're going to go through a couple of these hypotheses since we don't um, have time for all of them, but thinking about the multiplicity of brain networks in the brain that are important for language and reading, um, as Jessica was, was uh, alluding to at the beginning, in the language disorders in the aging population, we saw that different networks in the brain corresponded with specific phenotypes or subtypes of difficulty in language. So the hypothesis would be that, yes, there are some networks that are most important for reading, but there might be contributions and interactions with other networks, and that will create probably different subtypes of what we call um, dyslexia. So the most uh, recognized theory and hypothesis is definitely phonological, that phonological awareness is the cause of the cognitive mechanisms. So manipulating the sounds uh, that form words uh, is, and difficulty with manipulating the sounds and perceiving the sounds is the cause of uh, developmental uh, dyslexia. There are pros and cons to this, um, to this approach. Um, we definitely uh, know that phonological skills are required for fluent reading. We also know that children with dyslexia generally perform worse on phonological tasks, although I might say that some of these phonological awareness tests might be also influenced by the other functions like attention and um, executive functioning. Um, we also know that phonological skills um, often account for, for variants. They correlate with how well a child reads, indicating that the two processes might um, influence each other. Uh, and then we definitely know that literacy instruction that teachers letter sound correspondence is effective in teaching children how to read regardless of whether they're dyslexic or not. However, there is also some cons that makes us think that maybe there is something more than just a phonological awareness impairment. So it is unclear, in some cases, phonological difficulties might actually be caused by, by something else, like uh, um, 
uh, an executive functioning difficulty. Um, not all children with phonological impairment have dyslexia, and if we turn the argument around, not all children with dyslexia have phonological impairment. And also, many children with dyslexia will not respond to phonological intervention. So we think that although it is no doubt that phonological awareness difficulties are a cause of um, dyslexia, there might be more to it that you might have observed in, in your um, classroom. From a neurobiological, and we will go back to, to, to that. From a neurobiological point of view, what is the cause of dyslexia? We don't really know what is happening in the brain. As a behavioral neurology, that was my first question. Is that how come that we really don't know from a neurobiological perspective, where is dyslexia coming from in the brain? And this is something that we, um, uh, that, uh, we and others are starting to pay more attention to. So we know that migration, neuronal migration, we saw is so important in the development of the brain. Could there be some differences in neuronal migration? Yes, that's what it seems to be. There are very few studies, and this is what we're working intensely on. There will be only four brains of dyslexic individuals looking at, um, at the my microscopic level. Looking at the MRI of some of the children in our cohort, what we see is that some of the little spots of gray matter of neurons that started from here, as we showed in, a, uh, in the previous slide, and are migrating up, they might have for some reason stopped, and you see them here. And it's not a disease, it's not a tumor, it's not something that evolves. It's just like a little mole in the brain. It's a cell that quite didn't end up in the same, in the, in the right space, just like melanocytes in the skin might create a little mole in the, in the, in the skin. And that might influence how that part of the brain develops and maybe how efficiently, more or less efficiently, it processes some stimuli. It might also influence how the shape and the form of the, of the connections underneath it. And you can see it here that this part of the brain is the, the gyri are more um, compact than in this part of the brain. And this, again, might, it's a difference. It's not a disease, but it might help us understand where the um, reading or language difficulties are coming from. On the other hand, from the functional point of view, we said that the, that area in the brain, the visual warfarin area, really needs to, to, to uh, specialize for words, and it needs to create patterns of connectivity with the rest of the language brain that are very specific. In some individuals with dyslexia, we see that this connectivity is not quite as organized, at least in that part of the brain. And that might be, uh, and that is related to lang to reading abilities. So it might be that the connectivity and shape, and functional activation of that area, is um, uh, related to different abilities in in, in uh, reading. So important concepts to remember: biological factors, environmental factors. Um, uh, brain development, um, different aspects, different brain muscles or cognitive factors, all of these aspects are important to um, think about when we uh, uh, study, care for, or teach uh, um, about dyslexia and um, uh, really we need to, to keep a multifactorial uh, model in, in mind. So what about the different, um, the different phenotypes or the different subtypes? The approach that we take at UCSF is really an approach that we've taken in studying and, and caring for um, individuals with cognitive differences in, um, in, in adults, which has not been done that often in, in children, is to really take a whole brain approach. So we don't want to only look at reading. We want to look at reading in the context of other cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Thinking of these uh, different brain networks and different functions in the left and right hemisphere. And what neuroscience is starting to tell us is that these different networks in the brain are sometimes functioning in balance with each other. So when the red network is, is activated, the blue network might be suppressed. And this balance might give rise to some of the strengths and weaknesses that we see in children and, and um, adults. And some of these might emerge only in the context of uh, neurodegenerative disorder or neurodevelopmental difference, and might give rise to the uniqueness of uh, some um, individuals. So if we look at these different language networks and what they do, um, 
and take the correspondence between colors here and the brain with a, with a, a grain of salt. But it's, let's say that there is this more dorsal and posterior areas in the brain that have to do with keeping words in mind. So when you are, um, uh, as a teacher, uh, uh, giving instruction to the children or as a parent trying to get kids ready to go out in the, in the morning and start telling them, uh, you take the backpack, put your lunch into it, get your coat, put your hat on, and I'll see you in the car in five minutes. There is a lot for a child to keep in mind online at the same time. This is what phonological short-term memory does. It's a few seconds, and it needs to hold all these words in, in mind uh, at the same time. And then we can think about we need to process those sounds. We need to distinguish the, the syllables and the sounds within the word. And those that can be um, thought of as phonological processing. We also need to know the, the meaning of that word. And we need, if we see the word in print, to be able to recognize it visually. And then we need to pay attention and be able to plan and understand what the concept of time, what comes before and what comes after, and um, parse the word in different pieces. And that is where executive and attention uh, processes are really important. And then we need to be able to articulate the word, or in the case of writing, to use fine um, uh, motor um, uh, skills to write the words. So sensory motor integration is also important. And all of these functions, all these different networks and corresponding functions all contribute to reading. And these networks are connected with each other, especially in the left hemisphere, but also connected to similar networks in the right hemisphere that might have something to do with social emotional processing, which is processed more in the right hemisphere, and also important, for instance, for math. So if we think about all of this together, we can uh, associate different difficulties and strengths with the different aspects of cognition and neural networks, and think about all these different names that we give to uh, uh, developmental differences, not just dyslexia, but nonverbal language disability, ADHD, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and how all of these are really connected through the different functions and, and anatomical biology, anatomical neurobiology um, in, in the brain. We can also start to create hypotheses based on the connectivity of the uh, that we know of the brain and think that maybe someone who has difficulties with the phonological and short-term memory aspects of language, the connected visual network on the other side of the brain might actually be released, might have that enhanced activation. And this could give the predictable patterns of strength and weakness and then are not just anecdotal, don't just depend on the fact, well, a child cannot read and maybe communicate with language that efficiently, so they're going to use visual processing or they're going to uh, use um, strategy to understand meaning more efficiently. It might not be a reaction. It might be how that brain was particularly shaped and developed to start with. And we could almost think that we can identify people's weaknesses from actually their strength and predict them because one cannot come without the other. So for instance, as an example, if we think about a, a classic common case of dyslexia of a child with a phonological weakness, and we might see that in the brain by a, a little change in this part of the brain that is really devoted to phonological processing. And maybe the connectivity of that part of the brain is, is decreased, and the corresponding network on the other side, on the right side of the brain, that is more involved in visual and emotional processing, is actually hyperconnected and functionally functioning in a different way that might create a particular strength. And so in this child, the phonological weakness would, for instance, be um, associated with a visual strength. And by looking at the whole child and looking at different aspects in the, in, uh, I would say, the whole brain uh, approach, we can see different patterns. And these are examples of three children is one of my oldest slides that I always uh, like to show. But these three children are all three diagnosed or identified as dyslexics, but they have very different uh, pattern of strength and weaknesses. So we actively study this at UCSF. We've talked about this for a while. We get 
asked, so how many phenotypes are they? We, there is not a clear cut answer yet. Um, and there are children that show um, uh, a combination of uh, st strength and weakness. So there is definitely a big component of the children that we see that have an executive uh, difficulty more than we would have expected. And these are not children that also have ADHD, but we really think that their difficulty with reading might be related to uh, specific executive difficulties. This pattern shows up in children who are a little older, who usually have learned um, if they've been taught properly how to decode at least at a, at a, um, uh, uh, to some degree. Um, and, and then there is a component in, in which we see visual processing difficulties, not vision, but visual processing uh, difficulties that we um, are actively studying. Why is this important? Um, again, borrowing from what we know in adults, if we identify the exact neurobiological and behavioral uh, correspondence between uh, 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 symptoms and uh, uh, networks in the brain, it gives us a really good anchor to then understand what are, what are the best interventions especially early on, and I think I'm going to skip this, you probably have heard it in other presentations, how important it is to um, uh, intervene early uh, before children experience failure for, for many, many years. And this is a, a slide that I borrowed from um, uh, Nadine um, Gab. So we want to try to identify children um, not with dyslexia, but with risk of developing dyslexia later, early on, when interventions are more effective, and not wait until second, third, and fourth grade when they've already experienced two or three years of failure. And this brings us back to those to that time of pruning and myelination in the brain, in which the language system is particularly sensitive to uh, environment and type of instruction and um, exposure to literacy. Um, this is another uh, way of, of, of showing the same concepts. And this um, just wanted to briefly mention that we actively working at UCSF and with uh, SCOE and with the uh, generous support of the state on a digital system for early uh, detection of risk of um, reading difficulties and uh, uh, develop specific uh, interventions. So I just wanted to give you, I don't have much time left, I think. Um, so how, how long do you still give me, Jessica? Uh, you, can, you can go eight to 10 minutes, 10 more minutes, and then we'll have okay. time for questions. Yeah, so please keep going. Wonderful content. Great. So I just wanted to show you um, a couple of examples of the more kind of maybe different studies that we're doing at UCSF using this whole brain approach, especially looking at social emotional and I would say emotional processing in children and mathematical cognition, two aspects that are very important and dear to to our hearts and and our and our brain. I shouldn't say our heart, <laughs> and um, uh, in the sense that you know our social emotional responses come from the brain as well. Although we'll see that we actually measure them looking at how the heart responds. So it, it, it is an interesting uh, combination of heart and brain. So. Um, why are we looking at, at, at emotions? And we, our first paper with um, Drs. Virginia Sturm and Eleanor Pauser on the topic was really difficult to get uh, published because, like, why are we? Why are you looking at emotions in children with uh, with dyslexia? And um, it was interesting to me coming from the world of adult of adult um, uh, behavioral neurology and, and psychiatry, and that's a question that it was never was never being asked before. It was really clear how if someone has a difficulty or a difference in processing one aspect of cognition, everything is so interacting that you have to look at their whole brain to actually give an informed opinion on what, what is happening. So 
We know that dyslexia or learning language challenges come mainly from the left hemisphere of the brain, while emotions really emerge from the networks that uh, specific networks more lateralized to the right hemisphere is of course not as simple and there is a lot of interactions, but we can use that as a as a basic model so in while the left hemisphere will process the language attached to a specific situation, the right hemisphere might uh, be more involved in feeling the emotion that this woman in trouble with two little children um, uh, uh, is experiencing feeling and and uh, connection with this situation and also perceiving it more more visually so dyslexia um, is a, a difficulty with written language we've seen and shown that there might be relatively strength relative strengths in visual processing could there be relative strengths in emotional empathy uh, coming from the right hemisphere especially within the classic phenotype uh, of phonological dyslexia so how do we study emotions being lucky as we are at ucsf when i first thought of this idea um, eleanor and virginia who have shown you the pictures of before are world experts in emotions. So what are emotions? Are sure-lived phenomena. They're both psychological and physiological. So they're able to uh, alter our attention, trigger behavior, activate memory. We all know that we have sharper memories of emotional events in our, in our life. But they also come from a combination of physiological states. So we, we know that when we feel an emotion, we change our facial expressions, the tone of our muscles changes, the temperature of our skin changes. So they're really a combination of uh, uh, physical and uh, psychological brain uh, phenomenon. We can study them in the lab um, by um, showing uh, individuals videos of emotional situations that have been um, uh, 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 established and normed uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, many, many individuals. And we can um, record at the same time heart rate, respiration, skin conductance, so that specific um, more physiological aspects, autonomic aspects of emotions. So we look at heart rate, respiration, and um, that's why I was saying is a connection between the brain and the heart, because actually the heart rate is connected to how we feel when we see a, a certain um, in the lab, a certain movie. And then we look at facial expressions. This was a science that were really, was really started at UCSF by Paul Heckman, who's actually the, the gentleman in this in this photo, and is really of analyzing the single muscles in the face that are um, that contract in different way to create facial expressions. And then we also ask verbally how people react to videos. So, so this looks at the more language component. So I think I'm going to skip this, maybe just show you super quickly. This is two children looking at a disgusting video cleaning uh, earwax from a, from an ear. And you can see that child one is kind of okay. He's not loving it but he's not having too much of a reaction uh, to it a neurotypical um, uh, uh, child who kind of has a reaction at the end at the most disgusting part of it and then a child with dyslexia who has this very uh, uh, kind of you can see an enhanced kind of reaction and facial expression to it. So you can see the variability on how we, we see this phenomenon. And what we saw is actually that children with um, uh, this group of children, 30 children with phonological dyslexia actually had enhanced um, reactivity, behavior and heart rate to these videos. And the children who had higher reactivity were also rated by their parents as having greater social skills. But unfortunately, they also had more anxiety and depression. So what is actually a strength of having been more able to react and understand social emotional emotions uh, can be a weakness in the sense that it can make them at risk of becoming more uh, anxious and depressed and, and thus the need to really protect them and um, uh, 
um, help them use their, their strength. Um, we also look at heart rate. This is interesting. We have two um, systems in the, in the nervous system that are for fight or flight, or we call for, for rest and digest. And uh, what we saw is that children with dyslexia actually have greater um, heart rate variability, which is related to empathy. So they're both more reactive in the sense that they can understand facial expressions and they can and they express emotions themselves more um, in a maybe more nuanced way, but also they have uh, the data seems to show that they have greater parasympathetic activity, meaning that they um, uh, uh, might have greater um, empathy. And this is just a graph showing these results. And um, on the other hand, they also had difficulties with vocabulary for emotions. And so again, this is just to show you that there, there are patterns of strengths and weaknesses in this multifactorial complex behaviors that we need to keep in mind. So emotions are multifaceted. They reflect functioning of specific brain networks. And it's interesting to see that individuals with dyslexia, specifically phonological dyslexia, might be fine-tuned to navigate uh, the social world. But this heightened emotional sensitivity might make them more vulnerable to um, affective uh, um, issues such as anxiety and, and depression. So while these particular skills will serve them well in their life during their school years, we really need to protect them from uh, stress and bullying and feeling uh, incapable. As we think about socio-emotional curricula, I hear that a lot when I visit schools and talk to teachers and educators. Um, we need to think of the varieties here too, that some mindful, um, for instance, mindfulness uh, training might be useful for a group of kids, while for others, teaching emotional vocabulary or facial expression recognition might be more important. Um, one last point that is really the same point relates to mathematical cognition. We have a great group at UCSF that studies mathematical cognition from the really basic science component to the teaching um, component. Um, Bettina Piedmonte, Krista Watson, and Pedro Pinheiro Chagas, and um, really are looking at the cognitive biological basis of math processing and also uh, how thinking in the same way as we think about dyslexia of different subtypes and um, of a larger uh, process called mathematical cognition. Just as in dyslexia, what we call dyscalculia, so a focal difficulty, an isolated difficulty in mathematical cognition is very influenced by environmental factor, by um, instruction, by an, an interesting different way, maybe than even more than reading, by psychological uh, factors. So stigma and feeling incapable in, in, in in, in math can really influence someone's uh, performance. And then we have the correspondence to dyscalculia, to dyslexia, so a developmental difference in, in, the, in the brain that causes uh, difficulty specifically in acquiring um, mathematical skills in, in, in individuals with uh, a typical intelligence and um, uh, appropriate education. So really a mirror of the definition for uh, dyslexia. The two difficulties can co-occur, but um, often don't. And um, uh, I think we have a lot to learn. I think dyscalculia has been studied even less than, than uh, dyslexia. There are different definitions, same issue for the ICD-10 and arithmetic disorders is only a process in the computations of addition, subtractions, multiplications, while in the DSM-5 and, and other definition, developmental dyscalculia is a broader term that involves a difficulty in learning mathematical concepts. So not just basic arithmetics, but number sense, fluent calculation, and math reasoning that is important for 
uh, higher level uh, uh, mathematics like calculus and actually looking at the brain networks that sustain mathematics and some of them are overlapping because they're what we call uh, domain general or areas and networks in the brain that sustain attention, for instance, or working memory. Those will work both for language and for math. So certain types of dyslexia and dyscalculia will co-occur because they're really caused by the same difficulty. Some others might be separate because the brain network and the mechanism is separate. So for instance, number sense, the um, ability of an individual to estimate quantities even without the symbol of of digits that is really think thought of as a separate process from language so those two might occur together less less often so same concept i don't want to go through the details but there are different aspects in in math and there's not going to be one uh, solution that fits all uh, we are creating a battery with all the individuals that you saw in the previous pictures and the whole team that really looks at the different aspects of math cognition that map into the different networks in the brain. In general, we think about number processing, so this uh, basic processing of, uh, uh, of uh, numbers and quantities. And then we think of abilities to make to do calculations, mental calculations, but also written calculations. And uh, we think about arithmetic facts as and geometry as four different aspects of math that we should look at separately. The battery that we have at UCSF uh, that we've been conducting seems to indicate that there is a different um, uh, frequency of difficulties with math, and we. Just like we have a, this difficulty of whether we want to call uh, dyslexia subtypes or phenotypes, or we want to give different names to each uh, phenotype, the same issue is with math. Do we call these all dyscalculias or um, other different um, types of mathematical cognition difficulties? But we do identify children with dyslexia that have different uh, difficulties uh, with number processing at different aspects of it. So in summary, um, I hope I um, convince you that a whole brain approach, uh, applying neuroscience concepts uh, will help us better understand patterns of uh, strengths and weaknesses in dyslexia, that we, um, that interventions should really keep in mind uh, language weaknesses, but also strategies based on strengths that um, are associated with different uh, subtypes of dyslexia. And so once size doesn't fit all, and we wanna apply to uh, neuroscience, medicine, and, and education or really precision, um, uh, uh, precision uh, approach. Um, really important that we all work together, clinicians, scientists, education, and legislators, and uh, to solve what we know can be a downward spiral of learning uh, differences, and that we try to build bridges between our uh, silos in which our children have too often um, uh, fell through the, the cracks. So thank you so much for your attention thank you to all the collaborators that have made this work possible to the children and families and teachers that um, have participated in our studies and um, all the colleagues at the ucsf dyslexia center thank you thank you dr gorno tempini what a wonderfully informative presentation it was just amazing we have about two more minutes so maybe we can fit a question or two in um, and i'll begin that in a moment but before i do i just wanted to remind everyone about the webinar companion document so that yep that slide please and this is a wonderful document that includes prompts to discuss after attending the webinar and additional resources to further explore the content the webinar companion documents and recordings can be found at scoey.net slash CA dyslexia. So the last slide we'll show you is our survey slide. Uh, as we are asking this final question or two to Dr. Gorno Tempini, please do click on the link in the chat and fill out the survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts. 
So Dr. Gorno Tempini, we received a question that asked, can you clarify the visual component that is implicated in dyslexia, especially when the research states that dyslexia is not a visual difficulty? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I wanted to stress that it's like they're not a visual vision difficulty in the sense that children don't have vision problems, primary visual problems. So in that back visual part of the brain that we were um, uh, we were talking about, that there are areas that and neurons that are specifically tuned to basic aspects of vision. So if a line is straight or if it's uh, tilted or whether uh, an item is red or blue or whether um, uh, it, the um, a stimulus is stationary or it moves so from the the let's say the first uh, time in which the 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 stimulus from and the signal from the visual world comes into the brain is basically only uh, is there something or not or shades and unspecific patterns and children don't have trouble with that. What the research is starting to show and and we actively working on that is the more subtle and more specific aspect of visual processing that is not just seeing if something is there or not or if is. Uh, uh, bright or not, but it's more the shape, the movement, and how that visual area of the brain that is called the visual warfare area is tuned to specific visual features of words uh, might be part of the picture for some um, children, and how they can uh, scan the page efficiently, and how can they pay attention to specific aspects of the shape of letters or long words. So it's not a vision problem, but there might be, and we think there are, uh, a percentage of, of children in which the interaction between the visual system and the language system is less efficient. And we might need to start from the visual system to then move to also the language system. So I'm not saying that um, only visual, a visual training might be able to solve dyslexia for those individuals, but uh, we need to pay attention to those aspects too. And, and there haven't been really rigorous studies um, uh, looking at this in a large cohort of children. For instance, there is anecdotal evidence that for some people, the dyslexia fonts might help, but who are those people and do they really have um, a, a visual perceptual problem, or is it more an attention problem? That's where the whole whole brain approach will help us, because if we study both visual perception from the experts in visual perception and attention and language in the in the same context, then we'll need we will be able to tease these things apart. And I think for parents and teachers, it will be less frustrating and less trial and error to find the strategy that works best to remediate dyslexia. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. But if you do still have questions or you entered them into the Q&A and they haven't yet been answered, you can put your questions in the survey. And if they are um, appropriate for Dr. Gorno Tempini, we can forward them on to her for her expert thoughts. Um, otherwise, we'd be happy to answer them with our expert network at SCOE and or Glean. So thank you again for all your time, for making time in your workday for this important learning. And thank you to Dr. Gorno Tempini to SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative for this amazing series that we've had this year. Thank you all. Thank you.